update is the public consultation document which provides a concise summary of the financial challenges faced by the authority as a result of the ongoing cuts to its grant, a summary of structural change options open to the authority to make the necessary savings, and my professional view on each. Appendices 2 and 3 on pages 169 to 213 contain a record of all of the correspondence entered into by officers and members of the public, MPs and councillors over the proposal. The consultation events themselves are listed at paragraph 23 on page 138 through to 139 which I will uh, I'll just read them out for you members. So there was the focus group at Sorgo Massey, a focus group in West Kirby, a focus group in Upton, a public meeting in Sorgo Massey, a stakeholders meeting in Hoylake, a public meeting in Upton, a public meeting in West Kirby, and then an all will joint forum at Birkenhead Fire Station. The report goes on to provide specific details around the outcomes from each of the individual components of the consultation process that I've just listed in some detail. Paragraphs 30 to 34 on pages 139 to 140 and at appendix 6 of pages 311 to 326 provide the detail of the outcomes from the online questionnaire <laughs> and the questionnaires that were returned in hard copy at public meetings. Paragraphs 35 to 42 on pages 140 to 143 provides a summary of the outcomes from the focus groups and <coughs> deliberative forums with the full detail contained in the Opinion Research Services Report at Appendix 5 on pages 261 to 310. I just need to point out at this point, members, there is a typing error in the report which refers to that as Appendix 7 rather than 5. Okay, it is Appendix 5. Paragraphs 43 on pages 143 to 144 provides a summary of the outcomes of the postal survey of 10,000 homes, 5,000 of which were on the Upton Station area, which includes Sorgo Massey, and 5,000 of which were on the West Kirby Station area. That survey and its outcomes are also referenced within the Opinion Research Services Report of Appendix 5. Paragraphs 44 to 59 on pages 144 to 146 provides a summary of the outcomes of the public meetings and the stakeholder forums. Appendix 4 at pages 215 to 260 captures a summary of the questions raised and the answers that I gave in response at the public meetings. It would be remiss of you members not to draw your attention to the financial implications within the report of paragraphs 68 to 71 on page 148. In total, the cost of this process was £46,343. I should point out, members, that that's in addition to the first consultation process of the Greasby site which was £18,744. That, of course, takes no account of the officer time that was invested in both of the processes. Now, we will undoubtedly be criticised by uh, for this outlay, quite possibly by the very people who insisted that we hold the second consultation. The lesson here is, members, that whatever we do, we can't win. Right? That's certainly been my experience through the, uh, this consultation and all the others that we've undertaken. Paragraph 6 to 14 on pages 136 to 137 in the main body of the report summarise the overall outcomes from the process. <coughs> I don't propose to read through them all now, members, because you will have had the, the opportunity to yeah. do so. I will summarise, however, to say that there is significant opposition to the merger proposal from the residents of Sorgo Massey. I gave an undertaken at the public meetings that I would faithfully represent their views. 
And I believe that the comprehensive report that you have in front of you today does just that. That said, the views of the people of West Kirby, Hoylake and Mells also need to be heard, as it is they who would suffer longer response times if the merger was not to go ahead. The absolute majority of participants in this process consider that the merger proposal is reasonable in the circumstances. If I quote directly from paragraph 22 and 23 of the Opinion Research Services report on page 274, in general though, there is considerable support for the authorities' preferred merger option. In fact, the levels of support manifest in the resident survey and deliberative meetings might fairly be described as emphatic. Bear in mind, members, that the resident survey elicited over 10 times the responses than the, online, uh, the, the questionnaire. So MFRA may proceed on the basis that it has considerable community support for its draft proposal. The next sentence, however, points out, rightly, that this is not simply a numbers game, which is correct. Not least because the primary concern of the Fire and Rescue Authority is with the discharge of functions under the Fire and Rescue Services Act, which members I will cover on the next report on the agenda. I'll pause at that point, members, to take any questions that you might have. Excuse me, I'm sorry, so, but we've got a leak here. Yeah, the check in Okay, so uh, colleagues, um, we're talking about here seven, which is the process of consultation. It's just uh, condensation coming out of the air conditioning box. Um, uh, are there any, uh, you want to move to the seat behind, are you okay? Uh, are there any questions regarding the issue of, come on to the decision making in a moment, but any questions regarding the um, consultation process here? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I clearly will just talk about the consultation. Hopefully you'll allow me to cover more on item eight as we move forward. I mean, it, it, I think it's fair to say that um, the residents in Sorbel Massey and, and in, in Furness probably the, the wider rural area, many of those residents have the um, opinion, whether it's correct or not, that there has been some collusion between the Chief Fire Officer and his officers and senior officers of Willowborough Council, particularly in relation to the identification of sites. And I think really we'd just like to bottom that out here today and have a response from the Chief. From my understanding, there were six sites um, primarily um, detailed which could be possible venues for a new merge fire station to be built. If the Chief could just to allay the fears of the public and hopefully to dispel the myth that there, you know, that, as I say, their belief that there has been any collusion, could he please just go through those six sites that were given to us in the beginning and just say for whatever reason each one of those was dismissed. Um, there's a particular area which is a wooded area in the sort of Massey area which although the residents may not have liked it to go there I think they would have found it a little bit more palatable but when the decision was taken by Willowborough Council to withdraw the site from Greasby it would appear that this site that we're talking about here today in Sobel Massey actually popped up. Um, and I'm just wondering what the process was of that. And I think it would be helpful not only to myself and, and all members here, but particularly to the members of the public, if we could just know why and um, for what reasons those six sites um, were either dismissed or we are where we are today with the, the present decision that we're going to make um, on item eight. Um, it has been useful as well um, to look at some of the email trails in relation to the freedom of information requests that have been made by a member of the public. Um, and I'm sure that member of the public um, clearly knows who he or she is. But there was um, a couple of points which residents and, and infirmers ward councillors have asked me to raise here today and I wanted to do that publicly. Um, and if perhaps you will bear with me and perhaps again if we could just have an answer um, as to the explanation. There was an email which um, was sent to a senior officer at the World Council, um, one of the emails which came to light via the Freedom of Information request from the Deputy Chief Executive, 
in which um, clearly he thanks um, an officer of Willow Borough Council for their efforts and their pragmatic advice. I understand that is probably in relation to um, identifying the site. Um, and it's expressed that it seems to be re a really exciting development and one which the whole management team and Merseyside Fire and Rescue would be really keen on. Um, and um, he therefore looks forward to working with the officer from Willow Borough Council. And a remark was made um, about um, we, we now look forward to deliver the operation Reading by Firelight begins. What does that term, Operation Reading by Firelight begins, mean? Um, it, it's here, um, it, it's confusing to all, but it's something which residents and board councillors in that area have um, hitched onto, really, and perhaps quite rightly, where they do feel that the, it is just one of perhaps many reasons why they believe that there has been some collusion with the officers of Willow Borough Council. I'm not saying that, it's what residents have asked me to raise here today. Councillor Kearns, you've indicated uh, it's on the same point. Yes, sir. Very good. Sorry, Chair. Very much so. I, I, I think it's wrong for the member. I never said I'm a new member. I've been around politics for a lot longer than a member. I've been a member saying it. But I think it's wrong for a member to come here and say there's been collusion and not substantiate. In, in the speech that she's just made, not substantiate one iota of any proof of collusion to choose that site. It could have been asked in, in, in the basis, why was that site chosen? But that wasn't the thing. It was an accusation against the Chief Officer, and that shouldn't be allowed to happen. Thanks, Chairman. Chairman. Councilor Gladden, I'll come back. Councilor Gladden, is this on the same point? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, and really, just, just to take it forward, because you know, it's always somebody said or somebody said or this was, this was carried on. The thing, no matter what, following on from the chief's position or our position, is that any decision will be taken by the planning department or the board of council. But, you know, there's going to be, on that council, as far as I know, on that committee, will be representatives from every, every one of the political parties. Collusion, there can be as much collusion as you like be pe between people wanting to talk, but the final decision on whether or not that piece of land or any piece of land goes to anywhere will have to be made by, 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 those, by those people there. So in reality, um, when you say that collusion, what you're really doing is you're accusing those people as well. They are actually the, the only part along them, the, the licensing, and planning are the only councils, the committees on the council, that are subdued. They, they are on, on the law. Uh, and so when Councillor Rainey starts talking about collusion, you start to pull people in there and be blunt about it. They have to be sent to jail for less than that. So, you know, it, it's easy enough to, to throw these things out uh, and, and it, may, it may, good, may be good for the public. Uh, but, you know, I, I think. You're, you're actually attacking some of your own people as well. You actually sit on those committees. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's not my intention. I think I did say I was asking the question because it is perceived by some members of the public. I'm not saying that I perceive it, um, and I certainly hope you know that that isn't the case. And I do believe it's not the case, and that's why I specifically asked if you could dispel the myths that are going around and, and ask the chief fire officer just to itemise the reasons why these other sites were dismissed, and I think that would then satisfy members of the public. Um, you know, I'm taking no lectures from members of, of the Labour Party accusing me of asking, saying that officers have colluded. That not, was not what I said. I said I was asking the question because it was something which was in the mind of local residents and perhaps some of board colleagues out there. And all I'm doing to, for those Labour members who clearly would like to, you know, stop throwing things at me, carry on if you wish to, but I am asking for that, that myth to be dispelled. So that at least when we come to the next item, I would hope that the members of the public, you know, have in their minds that we have done all we can as a fire and rescue authority to make sure that those other sites were not suitable for this particular merger that is proposed. Okay, so the political management of the authority, as we know, is in the hands of members. And we delegate these decisions to our officers. And we know that for a prolonged period of time, we have a plan to merge sites in the Wirral and other parts of the borough, other than the county. 
Um, and we delegated to our officers to look at the will as an option for merger. So, Chief? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd try and give the uh, Councillor that he'd be uh, uh, some of the assurances he said that she seeks all I have to say. I think <coughs> in, when, in circumstances like this, my experience has been that when views become very polarised, it matters probably not a great deal what I say. And so people have, have already made their mind, which, which is fine, I, I, I understand that. The uh, officers, um, the Deputy Chief Executive, uh, Kieran is uh, responsible for corporate assets and he has led with the, uh, the engagement with the local authorities in Knowsley, uh, Whittle and um, indeed St Helens <coughs> to identify sites for the, the merger options, of which there have been numerous. Um, the, the reason that the Greasby Library site was advanced first is because it was the only site <coughs> that was in the proximity of the, the midpoint three lanes end that is not in the, uh, in the green belt. It's clearly the, the operational principle around the merger is to get as close to the midpoint as you can for reasons which would be self-evident to you all. Challenge that we've had in the world is, is that there is, it, it, unlike St Helens, for example, if you consider them today, you look between Eccleston and St Helens, is the, is the St Helens town centre, and then a, a large portion of residential, retail, and industrial areas. So, that, in one sense, a slightly, uh, slightly less problematic undertaking from an environmental perspective, but no less problematic from actually trying to find somewhere that you can physically secure. So we pursued numerous sites on the Wirral. The Greensby Library site was the one that officers from Wirral uh, suggested to us to consider simply because it already housed a library, a health centre and a children's centre. It was viewed in planning terms as a public care, uh, public services hub. Therefore, there was no planning reason, there is no planning reason why a, uh, a fire station couldn't be built on that particular piece of land. Uh, members should realise that we don't own the land, we don't have any compulsory purchase powers, therefore we are very much hostages to fortune in these negotiations given the fact that it's just not within our gift to go out and uh, secure land. We are very much beholden to the landowners. And as you'd expect in the first instance we would uh, we would engage with local authority partners because, as we've, uh, excuse me, words carefully now, the uh, dealing with the private sector is can be more problematic for reasons again which might be self-evident to you all. Once the, uh, the Greenbelt site was, uh, sorry, the library site was withdrawn, it was clear at that point then that the only other land that we could pursue that was in Wirral's ownership at that time again because we don't have compulsory purchase powers. And whilst we have uh, our agents on our behalf of uh, approached landowners in the vicinity of Three Lanes End, we can't force people to sell, nor can we force people to engage with us to uh, consider selling their land. The one piece of land that was suitable from a response perspective was the piece, or is the piece of land, that sits adjacent to Woodpecker Close, and is the one which is under consideration in our members. It's that simple. There is no... Uh, there is no hidden agenda here, it is just as simple as that. You know, we we uh, we can't compulsively purchase land, I can't magic land up out of nowhere. We've got to deal with what we've got and uh, I have to say that for the record I am very grateful to our colleagues in Wirral, to Nosley and to St Helens for all of the assistance that they've afforded us in that regard because it's been very time consuming for them as it has for us. But it is in the... Uh, it is in the pursuit of an outcome that delivers the least impact on community safety. Therefore, their efforts, in my view, are to be commended. Uh, in terms of the FOI request, I, I have no knowledge of uh, the, that particular request, and certainly reading by firelight is definitely not a comment that I would make. Uh, pause at that point, Chair. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't answer that. No, no, there's no opportunity for public. There's no opportunity for public. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is, is, are you okay with that? Yes, yes, fine. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions uh, at that stage? We move on to eight. Thank you. Uh, right. Well, the the recommendation here is is to uh, note the consideration uh, and note and thoroughly consider uh, the um, 
to be reported forward. So I think that's been done and agreed. Thank you. So we go on to item 8, uh, which are pages 371 to 382. And I would particularly draw your attention to the recommendations here, which are printed on page 371. Uh, Chief. Thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report, members, is to advise you of the operational response saving options for West Weddell, taking into account the outcomes of the public consultation process that you've considered in the previous report, and my professional recommendation to you <coughs> as to which option you should approve in order to achieve the least impact of outcome on operational response. Uh, members are well aware of the background to this particular pro uh, proposal, not least because you've just considered the, the consultation outcomes and, as I've said during, uh, in speaking to the last report, that we previously undertake the 12 week consultation process last year over the Greasby Library site. Uh, members are also well aware as to the reasons why we're having to make these structural changes, both for completeness and for the record. It's because of the ongoing cuts to our budget. The option to do nothing clearly is not an option. And I think also for the record members, uh, this isn't a report that we as officers would be putting in front of you if we had any other choice. Clearly we would keep all of our fire stations open if we were able to. The operational rationale for the merger proposal is detailed on paragraph 5 of page 372. It's been well rehearsed already in this meeting, so I don't propose to uh, speak in any great detail to that again. But it is, members, a matter of fact that the merger of the two whole time single pump stations into a one single pump whole time station as close as possible to the midpoint between the two existing stations does deliver the least impact on operational response. I say again, members, that is a matter of fact. As has been established previously, that fact's been recognised by the absolute majority of participants in the consultation process who have expressed support for the proposal and indeed a significant number of other fire and rescue authorities around the country who have pursued the same structural change option. As I make clear in the report of paragraph 7 on page 373, however, there is significant opposition to the proposal from Sorbonne Massey residents who have raised a number of observations and concerns throughout the consultation process. The overwhelming majority of observations and concerns relate to planning rather than operational response issues. Within the report, I'm attempting to deal with those <coughs> issues that do have some bearing on operational response. That's at paragraphs 9 to 15 on pages 373 to 374. The use of uh, rapid response vehicles was advanced on a number of occasions as an alternative to the merger and indeed Mr Spencer raised that very point in his address to the authority. Members uh, may be aware, possibly the new members won't be, but for their benefit, Merseyside was the first authority to introduce what was known back in the day as a targeted response vehicle. That's about 10 years ago now, members. The purpose of those vehicles, as the name would suggest, is to respond to small, non-life risk incidents, to ensure that rescue pumps uh, remain available to respond to life risk incidents. These vehicles were introduced as an additional resource, or more latterly, as an alternative to support pumps which, for the benefit of, uh, of everyone, are the second appliance on two appliance stations, as they are smaller, carry less equipment, and typically would be crewed by two to three firefighters, whereas a rescue pump is crewed by five firefighters, and a support pump is crewed by four. Members will recall that as a direct result of cuts to the authority budget during the last spending review, all but two of our support pumps were removed when appliance numbers reduced from 42 down to 28, and that took effect on the 9th of September 2013. 
The budgetary provision for small fires units, which we had at that time, was subsumed into the main element of the budget to maintain as many rescue pumps as we could. All of the stations on the will are now single appliance rescue pump stations. As recent as 2013, Wallasey, Birkenhead and Bromble all had support pumps. Okay, they were all two pump stations. Nowhere in the country has a targeted response vehicle been used or been introduced rather to replace a rescue pump at a single pump station. Targeted response vehicle cannot be deployed to life risk incidents as a first response as it carries insufficient equipment and crew to achieve a safe <coughs> system of work required to make an effective intervention. To give you a, uh, an example, members, the uh, National Operational Guidance Breeding Apparatus Command and Control Procedures, the minimum level of breeding apparatus entry control is rapid deployment, which requires on Merseyside a minimum of four personnel to deliver the safe system of work to initiate breeding apparatus procedures, which is something you would absolutely need to do at any house fire or domestic property fire like this incident. It's not a credible option, therefore, for the authority to replace a rescue pump at West Kirby with a targeted response vehicle. Notwithstanding the fact, members, that to crew a targeted response vehicle on a 24-7 basis would require at least 12 whole time equivalent posts, which to deliver the savings necessary to meet the 2015-16 budget assumptions would mean you would also have to convert the Birkenhead or Wallasey rescue <coughs> pump to a TRV. Like, there is no prospect I would recommend that that's what you did, members. Okay? Targeted response vehicles are not an option. They have never been used to replace rescue pumps. Right? We introduced them first here on Merseyside, and we've unfortunately been the first to take them away because we can no longer afford to crew anything other than rescue pumps. It is all about safe systems of work. Second issue raised, members, was traffic conditions in the area. Strictly speaking, that is a planning issue. Just make the following points, though, which are at uh, paragraphs 13 through 15. All of our authority drivers are trained to arrive safely at an incident. Okay? They do not drive at speeds in excess of that which are appropriate for the road conditions. The roads on West Whittle, for the avoidance of any doubt, right, present no greater challenges than the roads anywhere across Merseyside. <coughs> All our drivers are required to drive safely in the vicinity of schools, of houses and of any other building to reach an emergency incident in the quickest time possible. The other point to note here is, members, that if we proceeded with the outright closure of West Kirby, then the first response to uh, West Kirby station area would come from Upton and therefore would have to use the very roads that, were, that, that is being claimed that it's unsafe to drive on. That is a matter of fact, members. Not late, as, as early as last night, Upton <coughs> responded to an incident on Hoylake station area, a house fire in Hoylake, responding down Sorgal Massey Road, two, three lanes end roundabout, up Heron Road and onto Birkenhead Road, and didn't encounter any significant issues at all. There's no opportunity. Oh, there is no evidence, members, also from analysis of response times that there is any impact at all at peak times. If anything, mm -hmm. we are actually faster responding during the hours of 0700 to 1000 and 1600 through 1900 to incidents on the West Kirby station area from up them. As with all the merger proposals, officers have engaged with North West Ambulance Service and Merseyside Police over sharing of stations. As yet, neither organisation is committed to having a presence at the proposed site. 
If the merger proposal is approved, members should note, as the point that we've made previously, that any new station would not be operational until late 2016 <coughs> or early 2017 at the earliest. That is, of course, contingent on securing planning permission and the transfer of the land from Willow. The reasons explained in paragraph 18 to 21 on pages 374 and 375, it is no longer possible to crew appliances at non-key stations on every shift. That rotates around appliances, which is inclusive of Eccleston, which you've considered previously in St. Helens. Previously advised members at the budget meeting on the 26th of February, within report CFO 13, 2015 of the interim measures that I have now taken to minimise operation availability up to this point. Whatever happens, members, the availability of the West Kirby appliance will be maintained in the future through the utilisation of whole time retained crewing and whole time where it can be achieved. To summarise, members, the consultation process considered two options which are the merger of Upton and West Kirby, or the outright closure of West Kirby. All of the other options open to the authority, along with my professional view as to why I would not recommend them at this time, are contained within Appendix 1 of Report CFO 05915, which have considered immediately prior to this report. It remains my view that the merger proposal will result in the least impact on operational response of any of the options up to the authority, accepting that there are no recommendations I can make that will improve performance. That, members, is a matter of fact. It is my strong recommendation, therefore, that members approve the proposal to merge the existing fire stations at Upton and West Kirby and a new station as close as possible to the midpoint between the two stations at Three Lanes End. As it stands, the only land available to the authority is Adam Whittle's ownership on Sorgal Massey Road. <coughs> In the event that the recommendation is approved, officers will submit a plan and application and request the transfer of ownership from Will. The Equalities Impact Assessment for this proposal is appended to the previous report you've considered, and you've <coughs> considered that EIA clearly prior to this, uh, this point. The financial implications are detailed in paragraphs 31 to 34, which is on pages 376 to 377. You're all well aware by now, members, of the financial implications appertaining to the proposal and the reasons why we're having to pursue the merger in the first instance. But again, and in the interest of completeness and for the record, it is as a direct consequence of the ongoing cuts to the authority budget. And conscious members that we have debated or certainly discussed this issue at length, certainly up to this point, so I'll pause at that point to take any questions that you may have. The authority um, considered the report in principle, exposed it for comprehensive public consultation. That is now what we've got back before us. Councillor Welch. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask a question here. On targeted response vehicles, you say that these vehicles are to respond to small, non-life risk incidents. Can you give an example, please, of what a, a small, non-life risk incident would be? Yes, uh, it's, yeah, there's a, uh, what we term a secondary fire, so um, an antisocial small fire. Um, examples would be uh, bin bags and rear entries, that type of thing. Members, there's an opportunity for questions on this report. I'd just like to say, as a member of this authority, I'm very proud of what the Chief and the Deputy Chiefs do and all our staff. But I'm even more proud that we've got whole time firefighters and our response rates are the lowest in the country for the fire engine leaving the station and getting to your house. Anywhere else in the country, you're talking 10 minutes. Um, minutes cost a lot of us. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, Councillor Rennie, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, 
willing, willing to come in now. I mean, clearly, you know, today we're debating really um, what is best for the people of West Wirral. Um, I mean, it's a difficult decision, but we're, we're trying to come to some sort of conclusion as to how we can best offer those people the best operational preparedness and, in fact, the best operational response to those people, particularly um, if their lives are in danger of fire or if there's a serious incident or clearly they're trapped um, and need the assistance of Merseyside Fire and Rescue to rescue them from a road of traffic accident. But we're clearly not here to debate the issue of whether, whether or not it's a good idea to have it on Eden Belt land. We're here purely to look at the safety of the majority of the people in West Wirral. And probably, I, you know, I find myself here today, it's one of the, probably the most difficult decisions that I've had to make in 24 years of, of being a councillor. And it's a difficult decision, um, particularly for all of us, but, you know, for myself personally, I probably find myself forming an opinion which is in opposition to some of my colleagues on Wirral. And I'm sorry about that, but I have to take a pragmatic approach on what is the best opportunity of saving lives in that wider West Wirral area. And I just wanted to say thank you really to the work that those um, local councillors in the area have done in keeping residents up to date, because um, it has been confusing. I mean, we know the jargon and clearly the officers who have attended the public meetings have been very careful to, to try and not use jargon, get it all over to the people. Um, and they've done, they've done a good job, in my opinion, on that. But where there has been gaps of, of misunderstanding or um, where residents have wanted further information, then clearly those ward, those ward councillors have done a really good job on that. Um, but as I say, it's probably one of the most difficult decisions I've had to make. And it would be quite easy for me politically to say, well, I'm voting against that. Um, but if I did, um, then you know my own sort of standards would say, well, it, it is beholden on me then to identify where that extra funding would come from to fill that gap in our budget. And I have to say, I cannot do that. I cannot find anywhere else where I could take that money from so that we didn't have to go down the route of closing two fire stations in Wirral and having a merged fire station in Sorbel Massey. Um, so the only way that I can sort of square that for myself <coughs> is to really call on some of the life experiences that you know everybody has as life goes on. Um, and I have, um, you know, and I'm very grateful for the fact that I have been a member of another Blue Light organisation. And I have had to go along to incidents, and I'm not shroud waving here, and I'm not sort of, you know, hand on bleeding heart, but I have been at incidents where you will hold somebody whose life is just dripping away in front of you. And the only way that you could reconcile yourself and your conscience with that is to say to yourself, could I have done anything different to make this circumstances have a different outcome? Or could I have got here any quicker? And that is the only way that I've found through my, my life experiences that I can handle that. And I would imagine that is exactly what firefighters have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And for those reasons alone, I have to say that I have to put the safety of the 26,000 people in that West Wirral area at the forefront of my thinking. It, it's not an easy decision, but I do believe that those 26,000 people deserve to have the opportunity and the benefit of an extra two minutes response so that firefighters can get to them and give them the best chance of carrying on with life or uh, um, not obviously, you know, 